Hello again, and welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My name is Mike Parker, and I'm the instructor for the class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May, and we discuss the scriptures of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I would love to have you join us. Links to the class website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which include footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoy this lesson, please click the like button and share it with a friend and subscribe if you want to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. By way of introduction, key individuals who will be mentioned in this lesson, Lehi, who was a prophet called to preach in Jerusalem around 597 BC, Laman and Lemuel were his two oldest sons, Sam was his third son, Nephi was his fourth son and the author of the text that we are reading. Jacob and Joseph were Lehi's fifth and sixth sons. They were born in the Arabian wilderness. Zoram was a freed slave who came with Lehi's family to the Promised Land. Outline of events for this lesson. Uh, first, we're going to take a look at Lehi's farewell address, his last admonitions and testament to his posterity. That runs from 2 Nephi chapter 1 through chapter 4, verse 12. Nephi admonished his two oldest brothers and sorrowed because of his own weaknesses. That finishes out chapter 4. And then finally, the followers of Nephi and the followers of Laman separated into two groups. And that's 2 Nephi chapter 5. The setting using the BYU Virtual Scriptures Book of Mormon conceptual map, Lehi gave his farewell address in the land for the inheritance of my seed, the Lehites' first settlement on the western coast of the Promised Land. After the followers of Nephi separated themselves from the followers of Laman, Nephi's people did journey into the wilderness for the space of many days and established a new settlement that they named for their leader. Lehi's farewell address. This was his last admonition and his testament to his posterity. This was also his patriarchal blessing to his family members before he died. Lehi taught about the promised land. He counseled and warned Laman, Lemuel, and all the male individuals in the group to repent so they would prosper. Lehi explained how great things the Lord had done in sparing Laman and Lemuel's lives, despite their repeated rebellions. He declared that he had received another vision that confirmed Jerusalem had been destroyed, as he had previously prophesied would happen. The covenant blessing of Lehi's land of promise. This is 2 Nephi chapter 1, verse 5, through the first half of chapter 12. This is a long passage, but we're going to read it in its entirety so that we can understand in context about what and to whom Lehi was referring. Quote, But, said he, notwithstanding our afflictions, we have obtained a land of promise, a land which is choice above all other lands, a land which the Lord God hath covenanted with me should be a land for the inheritance of my seed. Yea, the Lord hath consecrated this land unto me and to my children forever, and also all those who should be led out of other countries by the hand of the Lord. Wherefore, I, Lehi, prophesy, according to the workings of the Spirit which is in me, that there shall none come into this land, save they shall be brought by the hand of the Lord. Wherefore, this land is consecrated unto him whom he shall bring. And if it so be 
that they shall serve him according to the commandments which he hath given, it shall be a land of liberty unto them. Wherefore, they shall never be brought down into captivity. If so, it shall be because of iniquity. For if iniquity shall abound, cursed shall be the land for their sakes. But unto the righteous it shall be blessed forever. And behold, it is wisdom that this land should be kept as yet from the knowledge of other nations. For behold, many nations would overrun this land, that there would be no place for an inheritance. Wherefore, I, Lehi, have obtained a promise, that inasmuch as those whom the Lord God shall bring out of the land of Jerusalem shall keep his commandments, they shall prosper upon the face of this land, and they shall be kept from all other nations, that they may possess this land unto themselves. And if it so be that they shall keep his commandments, they shall be blessed upon the face of this land, and there shall be none to molest them, nor to take away the land of their inheritance, and they shall dwell safely forever. But behold, when the time cometh that they shall dwindle in unbelief, after they have rejected so great blessings from the hand of the Lord, having a knowledge of the creation of the earth and of all men, knowing the great and marvelous works of the Lord from the creation of the world, having power given them to do all things by faith, having all the commandments from the beginning, and having been brought by his infinite goodness into this precious land of promise. Behold, I say, if the day shall come that they will reject the Holy One of Israel, the true Messiah, their Redeemer and their God, behold, the judgments of him that is just shall rest upon them. Yea, he will bring other nations unto them, and he will give unto them power, and he will take away from them the lands of their possessions, and he will cause them to be scattered and smitten. Yea, as one generation passeth to another, there shall be bloodsheds and great visitations among them." Unquote. Let's retrace our steps and carefully interpret Lehi's words in the context of the entire passage. Nephi introduced his father's teachings by writing in verse 3 that he spake unto Laman and Lemuel concerning the land of promise, which Lehi's family had obtained. Lehi spoke of this land of promise and said that it was a land which is choice above all other lands, a land which the Lord God hath covenanted with me should be a land for the inheritance of my seed. This land, he said, was consecrated unto me and to my children forever, and also all those who should be led out of other countries by the hand of the Lord. Regarding that last group, None shall come into this land, save they shall be brought by the hand of the Lord. Referring specifically to those who shall be brought to the land of promise by the hand of the Lord, Lehi declared that if they shall serve the Lord according to his commandments, the land would be blessed and be a land of liberty unto them. But if they worked iniquity, the land would be cursed and they would be brought down into captivity. Lehi's land of promise was kept as yet from the knowledge of other nations that the Lord's covenant promise might be fulfilled. The people mentioned in verses 5 and 7, the ones whom the Lord would lead to the land of promise and who would inherit the covenant promises of liberty, were those whom the Lord God shall bring out of the land of Jerusalem. This is almost certainly a reference to the people of Zarahemla, the Mulekites. The righteous Nephites will encounter them over 300 years after Lehi's time, and they will join with the Nephites and become one people. Lehi foretold that the time would come when those who had been brought by the Lord's infinite goodness into this precious land of promise, meaning Lehi's Lamanite descendants, shall dwindle in unbelief and reject the Holy One of Israel, the true Messiah, the Redeemer and their God. As a result of their iniquity, the Lord will bring other nations unto them and take away from them the lands of their possessions, and he will cause them to be scattered and smitten. These would be the Gentile nations that Nephi prophesied would be instruments of the wrath of God that would be brought upon the seed of his brethren. We discussed this in previous lessons, 1 Nephi chapter 13 and chapter 22. 
The covenant promises in 2 Nephi chapter 1 verses 5 through 6 are specific and do not refer to Gentiles in the last days, including those now living in the United States. Rather, Lehi and Nephi both referred to the Gentiles as the other nations that would come to scatter the descendants of Lehi and possess their lands. This is not to say that the Lord didn't have his own covenant blessings prepared for the Gentiles who would come here, but Lehi's prophecy in 2 Nephi chapter 1 is not about them. Lehi pleaded with his errant sons, Laman and Lemuel. He begged them to shake off the awful chains by which ye are bound, to awake and arise from the dust, and to not be led according to the will and captivity of the devil. Lehi's poetic imagery refers to those who are slaves or prisoners to sin and death. Slaves wear chains and sit in the dirt. He wanted his sons to be men and mighty warriors for righteousness, not slaves. He pleaded with them, a few more days and I go the way of all the earth. But behold, the Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell. I have beheld his glory and am circled about eternally in the arms of his love. That's chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. The intensity of Lehi's counsel to his sons came from, in part, his knowledge that he was about to die and would no longer be present to encourage them to be righteous. He had a sure knowledge, though, that the Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell, referring to Sheol, the Hebrew name for the world of the spirits of the dead. And he was circled about eternally in the arms of the Lord's love, and not by the chains of sin and death. He recited the covenant that the Lord made with Nephi at the Valley of Lemuel, quote, Inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land, but inasmuch as ye will not keep my commandments, ye shall be cut off from my presence, unquote. Lehi concluded his counsel to Laman and Lemuel by defending Nephi's righteousness and authority. Laman and Lemuel had accused Nephi of seeking for power and personal gain. Lehi told them that Nephi was not interested in power, but in the glory of God and your own eternal welfare. Ye say that he hath used sharpness, Lehi continued. Ye say that he hath been angry with you. But behold, his sharpness was the sharpness of the power of the word of God which was in him, and that which ye call anger was the truth according to that which is in God which he could not restrain, manifesting boldly concerning your iniquities. Since the beginning of their journey, it hadn't been about Nephi at all. Rather, it had been about the spirit of the Lord, which was in him. Lehi warned Laman and his other sons, If ye will not hearken unto Nephi, I take away my first blessing, yea, even my blessing, and it shall rest upon him. By this, he probably meant the rights of inheritance and family leadership that would normally fall to Laman as the oldest son. If Laman forfeited them through disobedience, Lehi warned those blessings would fall upon Nephi. Lehi then gave a brief blessing to Zoram, encouraging him to stay faithful and be blessed with Nephi's seed. Lehi next addressed his son Jacob, while his words in chapter 2 were specifically directed to Jacob, they were intended for the benefit of all his sons. Lehi referred to Jacob as my firstborn in the days of my tribulation in the wilderness. Calling Jacob his firstborn may be an indication Lehi considered him a spiritual replacement for his wayward oldest son, Laman. The name Jacob is also significant because it means supplanter, one who replaces another. Jacob had been faithful to Nephi and to God, and by this time had already been personally visited by the Lord. Lehi explained the plan of redemption and the doctrine of the necessity of opposition. His teachings are a masterwork, one of the great sermons found in all of Scripture. Second Nephi chapter 2 is far too complex for us to do it justice in this short lesson. I'll simply outline Lehi's argument and explore the doctrinal implications of some of his teachings. In the first part of his discourse, Lehi set up the problem of the human condition and the solution to it. Second Nephi chapter 2, verse 4b 
through verse 7. Quote, For the Spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the way is prepared from the fall of man, and salvation is free. And men are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil. And the law is given unto men, and by the law no flesh is justified, or by the law men are cut off. Yea, by the temporal law they were cut off, and also by the spiritual law they perish from that which is good and become miserable forever. Wherefore, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered." Unquote. Because all human beings are given the light of Christ, we know the difference between good and evil by nature. But no one is justified, or declared righteous, not guilty, by the law, because all of us violate the law in some way, even those among us who are good people. A small violation is still a violation. Therefore, by or because of the law and their disobedience to it, men and women are cut off from God, temporally and spiritually, and have become miserable forever. This is a rather pessimistic view of mortality. Modern prophets tend to focus in their teachings on the necessity and positive aspects of the fall of man. But the fall still created a problem that must be solved, the inevitability of physical and spiritual death. Because we cannot be redeemed through obedience to the law, because we don't obey it, Lehi taught, wherefore, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah. How does this redemption take place? The Holy Messiah offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Salvation is free. Those who accept it are not required to pay the price of their own sins. Continuing on to verse 8, Lehi explained this is why it's so important to teach this principle to all people. No one can dwell in the presence of God except it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. The Messiah will intercede with God for all the children of men, and they that believe in him shall be saved. We will all be brought before God to be judged of him according to the truth and holiness which is in him. Lehi taught that God's law decrees that there must be punishment for evil, which stands in opposition to happiness. In fact, the principle of opposition is universal and eternal. Without righteousness, there can be no wickedness. Without holiness, or perhaps happiness, there can be no misery. Without good, there can be no bad. Existence itself is dependent on experiencing opposites. Otherwise, the universe itself has no purpose, and that would mean God has no wisdom, power, mercy, or justice. Some may argue that perhaps there is no law. Lehi responded, that would mean there is no sin. If so, that would mean there is no righteousness. And if so, no happiness, nor its opposites, punishment and misery, and therefore no God. And as a result, no human beings and no universe. Lehi's statement was rhetorical. Of course there is a God and a creation. Therefore, he concluded, there must be law. Lehi explained that opposition has been in existence from the very beginning. For this, he drew on the accounts of the creation and the fall on the brass plates. The Lord established a state of opposition when he created mankind. He set up two trees, a tree with forbidden fruit and a tree of life, the one being sweet and the other bitter, each as equally enticing as the other. He also gave man his agency, the ability to act for himself of his own free will with consequences attendant to his choices. Also present in the garden was an angel of God who had fallen from heaven and become a devil, having sought that which was evil before God. Because the devil was miserable, he sought also the misery of all mankind. Remember, misery is the opposite of happiness. And so he deceived Eve in order to get her to partake of the forbidden fruit. 
Adam and Eve were driven out of Eden, and all mankind are their descendants. Our lives are a state of probation in which the Lord commands us to repent and shows us that we are lost. Perhaps one might be tempted to think it would have been better if Adam and Eve had not transgressed in the first place. We'd all still be in the Garden of Eden and everything would be wonderful. Well, nice try, but that wouldn't have worked because Adam and Eve wouldn't have had any children and would have remained in a state without opposition, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. The fall had to happen. Adam fell that men might be, and men are, that they might have joy. Lehi began his sermon by teaching that Christ had answered the ends of the law and brought salvation. After explaining the nature, purpose, and necessity of opposition, he returned to the subject of Christ and showed how he overcame the fall and made us free to choose eternal life. 2 Nephi chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. Quote, and the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he might redeem the children of men from the fall. And because that they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the law at the great and last day, according to the commandments which God hath given. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself." Unquote. We're all fallen beings, but the Messiah or Christ will redeem the children of men from the fall because we are redeemed, we are free forever, free to choose our actions, but not free to choose the consequences of our actions. Everyone is still subject to the punishment required by God's law for sin. So the choice is ours, to choose liberty and eternal life or captivity and death. Lehi concluded this part of his message by exhorting his sons to look to Christ, follow his commandments faithfully, and choose eternal life according to the will of his Holy Spirit, and not choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh and the evil which is therein, which gives the devil power to take us captive and reign over us. Lehi next blessed his youngest son Joseph and his posterity. He had taught him about the great prophet after whom he was named, Joseph, the son of Jacob and grandson of Abraham. Lehi's first blessing on his son Joseph was, May the Lord consecrate also unto thee this land, which is a most precious land, for thine inheritance, and the inheritance of thy seed with thy brethren, for thy security forever, if it so be that ye shall keep the commandments of the Holy One of Israel, for thy seed shall not utterly be destroyed. Lehi then rehearsed to him some of the prophecies of their ancestor Joseph of Egypt that were on the brass plates. Lehi declared that he was a descendant of Joseph, who was taken to Egypt, and with whom the Lord made great covenants. The Lord promised Joseph that from his descendants, the Lord would raise up a righteous branch unto the house of Israel that was to be broken off. This was a prophecy of Lehi and his descendants. Lehi quoted an extensive extract of a prophecy made by Joseph of Egypt the Lord would raise up a choice seer who would be great like unto Moses and would bring forth a record containing the Lord's word, which will confound false doctrines and reveal the Lord's covenants. The Lord would strengthen, bless, and protect this seer. The seer's name would be Joseph. He would be named after his own father and after Joseph of Egypt, for he would be a descendant of Joseph of old. The Lord would also make a spokesman for the seer who would write for him. The book they write would be the words of a dead people crying from the dust. That seer would be the prophet Joseph Smith, and his spokesman would be Oliver Cowdery. The record that they would bring forth is, of course, the Book of Mormon. Lehi then left his second blessing on Joseph 
which included further prophecies of Joseph Smith. Thy seed shall not be destroyed, for they shall hearken unto the words of the book. And there shall rise up one mighty among them, who shall do much good, both in word and in deed, being an instrument in the hands of God, with exceeding faith, to work mighty wonders, and do that thing which is great in the sight of God, unto the bringing to pass much restoration unto the house of Israel, and unto the seed of thy brethren. Nephi then added a brief afterward to his father's teachings about Joseph of Egypt. Lehi blessed the children of Laman, probably with great sorrow, that any cursing that came upon them would be answered upon the heads of their parents. He repeated them the Lord's covenant concerning the promised land. To the children of Lemuel he promised, Thou shalt not be utterly destroyed, but in the end thy seed shall be blessed. He gave his final blessing to the sons of Ishmael, who may have been the husbands of his daughters. Finally, he blessed his son Sam, that his descendants would be numbered and blessed with Nephi's descendants. Soon after that, Lehi died and was buried in the land of first inheritance. Soon after Lehi's death, Nephi recorded that Laman, Lemuel, and the sons of Ishmael were angry with me because of the admonitions of the Lord, for I, Nephi, was constrained to speak unto them according to the word of the Lord. To explain and defend his admonishment of his brothers, he wrote on his small plates the things of my soul and many of the scriptures that were on the brass plates. For my soul delighteth in the scriptures, and my heart pondereth them, and writeth them for the learning and the profit of my children. Nephi then lamented for his own weaknesses, and rejoiced in the strength and support he received from the Lord. The passage in chapter 4, verses 16 to 35, is called the Psalm of Nephi because of its poetic structure and literary similarities to the works in the Old Testament book of Psalms. It begins with an invocation in verses 16 and 17. Nephi delighted in the things of the Lord. It next became a complaint in verses 17 through 19. Nephi sorrowed because of his personal weaknesses and sins. Nephi is regularly portrayed as one of the most righteous of all individuals in scriptural history. His lament, my soul grieveth because of mine iniquities. I am encompassed about because of the temptations and the sins which do so easily beset me, is a telling statement of his humility and self-reflection. Next came a confession of trust. God had supported and loved Nephi, confounded his enemies, heard his prayers, and given him visions. Nephi criticized himself and exhorted himself to be more faithful. Then there was a petition, verses 31 to 33. Nephi asked the Lord to redeem him from his enemies and from sin. Finally, there was a vow of praise, verses 34 and 35. Nephi promised to trust the Lord forever. With Lehi dead, Laman and Lemuel finally acted against Nephi and tried to kill him. Having been warned by the Lord of his brother's plot, Nephi led his righteous followers away from the land of first inheritance. After a journey of many days, they arrived in a place they named after Nephi. They called themselves the people of Nephi, or Nephites. Nephi wrote that his people were strict in observing the law of Moses. They built a temple patterned after the design of the temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, only not as ornate and almost certainly not as large. They prospered in the new land, as the Lord had promised to those who kept his commandments. They armed themselves against the followers of Nephi's brothers, whom they called Lamanites. Nephi presided over the community as their ruler and protector. He consecrated his brothers, Jacob and Joseph, as priests and teachers to the people of Nephi. Nephi declared that we lived after the manner of happiness. The word of the Lord was fulfilled, and the people of Laman were cut off from the presence of the Lord. This is another passage that's important to read in context in its entirety. 2 Nephi chapter 5, verses 20 to 25, quote, 
Wherefore, the word of the Lord was fulfilled, which he spake unto me, saying that, Inasmuch as they will not hearken unto thy words, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And behold, they were cut off from his presence. And he had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing, because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white, and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. And thus saith the Lord God, I will cause that they shall be loathsome unto thy people, that they shall repent of their iniquities. And cursed shall be the seed of him that mixeth with their seed, for they shall be cursed even with the same cursing. And the Lord spake it, and it was done. And because of their cursing which was upon them, they did become an idle people, full of mischief and subtlety, and did seek in the wilderness for beasts of prey. And the Lord God said unto me, They shall be a scourge unto thy seed, to stir them up in remembrance of me, and inasmuch as they will not remember me, and hearken unto my words, they shall scourge them, even unto destruction." Unquote. Let's first examine the preludes to this action. When Nephi first inquired of the Lord and received a testimony of his father's prophetic calling, the Lord made a covenant with Nephi, Nephi's family, and their descendants. As part of his covenant, the Lord warned and promised that if Laman and Lemuel shall rebel against thee, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord, that Nephi would be made a ruler and a teacher over them, and that the Lord would curse them even with a sore curse, and they would be a scourge unto thy seed to stir Nephi's descendants up in the ways of remembrance. In Lehi's final admonitions to Laman and Lemuel, he told them that he feared because of the hardness of their hearts that they would be cut off and destroyed forever, or that a cursing should come upon you for the space of many generations. He repeated the covenant promise and penalty with the Lord's warning that inasmuch as ye will not keep my commandments, ye shall be cut off from my presence. Lehi pleaded with them to not be cursed with a sore cursing and to rebel no more against your brother Nephi. The cursing of Laman and Lemuel and their followers only came after multiple repeated covenant warnings given by the Lord. Why were the Lamanites cursed? According to the word of the Lord to Nephi, this cursing came about because they would not hearken to the words of Nephi, whom the Lord had made a ruler and teacher over them. They practiced iniquity and they had hardened their hearts against the Lord, that they had become like unto a flint. How were the Lamanites cursed? The curse was that they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. This was the fulfillment of the covenant promise made to Nephi that had been repeated to them by Lehi. This curse was lifted from any Lamanites who repented and converted to the gospel of Christ. Because of the Lamanites' wicked behavior and the curse that had been placed on them, the Lord feared that the people of Nephi would be attracted to the descendants of Laman, intermarry with them, fall into wickedness, and become subject to the same curse and be cut off from the Lord's presence. To prevent that from happening, the Lord caused a skin of blackness to come upon the Lamanites that made them loathsome to the Nephites. It's important to note that this skin of blackness was not the curse. Rather, it was a mark to differentiate the Nephites from the Lamanites. The curse was that they would be cut off from the presence of the Lord. What exactly was this skin of blackness, and how did it come upon the Lamanites? The long-standing traditional interpretation has been that the Lord miraculously changed the skin color of Laman and Lemuel and their descendants. This interpretation is based on literal reading of verse 21. They were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, 
Therefore, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. But what would the terms white, fair, delightsome, and blackness have meant to a Nephite? Lehi and his family were Hebrews from the ancient Near East. They would have been swarthy people with darker skins than what most of the people here in Utah would call white, probably similar to modern day Mandeans or Samaritans. Rather than describing a literal change in skin color, it seems to me that Nephi was describing a metaphorical one. He may have been contrasting fair and delightsome in this passage with his earlier prophecy that the Lamanites would become a dark and loathsome and a filthy people, which was a reference to their spiritual condition. Nephi also prophesied that in the last days, the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be declared among the descendants of his brothers, and their scales of darkness shall begin to fall from their eyes, and many generations shall not pass away among them, save they shall be a white and a delightsome people. When Joseph Smith edited the third edition of the Book of Mormon in 1840, he changed 2 Nephi chapter 30, verse 6, to read, save they shall be a pure and a delightsome people, indicating that he understood white to refer to the spiritual condition of the Lamanite descendants, not their skin color. There is evidence in the Book of Mormon that there was no noticeable difference between the overall skin color of the Nephites and the Lamanites. One example is in Alma chapter 55 during the Great Lamanite War. After failing to agree with the Lamanite King Amron regarding the terms of a prisoner exchange, Moroni, chief captain of the Nephite armies, devised a scheme to free the Nephite prisoners who were held in the city of Gid. Moroni ordered that a search should be made among his men that perhaps he might find a man who was a descendant of Laman among them. It's significant that Moroni had to search for a Lamanite soldier within his ranks. Had the skins of any of his Lamanite soldiers been black in contrast to the white Nephites, these men would have been readily apparent. Instead, Moroni had to ask around to see if perhaps a Lamanite might be found within his forces. Moroni did find a Lamanite whose name was Laman. Moroni caused that Laman and a small number of Moroni's men should go forth under the guards who were over the Nephite prisoners at Gid, bringing with them some wine. When Laman and the Nephite soldiers who accompanied him approached the Lamanite guards, the guards called out to him, demanding to know his identity. Laman responded, Fear not. Behold, I am a Lamanite. Behold, we have escaped from the Nephites, and they sleep. And behold, we have taken of their wine and brought it with us. Laman's repeated use of the plural pronouns we and us establishes that the Lamanite guards could see him and the others who were with him, and yet the appearance of the Nephites who were with him didn't raise any alarm or cause any suspicions among the guards. I believe the best explanation is that Moroni needed an authentic Lamanite not for his skin color, but because he could speak to the guards in their own language, dialect, or accent. If the skin of blackness wasn't a literal change in the Lamanite skin color, then what was it? The physical visual distinction between the Nephites and Lamanites may have been a mark made by the Lamanites themselves. In Alma chapter three, we read about the Amalekites, a group of Nephite dissenters who joined the Lamanites and became part of their society. The text directly connects the wickedness of the Amalekites to a mark. This is a long passage, so I've extracted just key portions of it. Alma chapter 3, verses 6 through 19. Quote, And the skins of the Lamanites were dark, according to the mark which was set upon their fathers, which was a curse upon them because of their transgression and their rebellion against their brethren. Wherefore they were cursed, and the Lord God set a mark upon them, yea, upon Laman and Lemuel, and also upon the sons of Ishmael, and Ishmaelitish women. And it came to pass that whosoever did mingle his seed with that of the Lamanites did bring the same curse upon his seed. Therefore, whosoever suffered himself to be led away by the Lamanites was called under that head, and there was a mark set upon him. Now we will return again to the Amalekites, for they also had a mark set upon them. Yea, they set the mark upon themselves, yea, even a mark of red upon their foreheads. Thus the word of God is fulfilled, for these are the words which he said to Nephi, Behold, the Lamanites have I cursed, 
and I will set a mark upon them, that they and their seed may be separated from thee and thy seed, from this time henceforth and forever, except they repent of their wickedness, and turn to me, that I may have mercy upon them. Now the Amalekites knew not that they were fulfilling the words of God when they began to mark themselves in their foreheads. Nevertheless, they had come out in open rebellion against God. Therefore, it was expedient that the curse should fall upon them. Now, I would that ye should see that they brought upon themselves the curse. And even so doth every man that is cursed bring upon himself his own condemnation. Unquote. Mormon explained that the skins of the Lamanites were dark according to the mark which was set upon their fathers, and that the Lord God had set this mark upon them. Likewise, any one who followed the Lamanite way of life and allied himself with them, there was a mark set upon him. This reiterated Nephi's statement that the Lord did cause a skin of blackness to come upon the Lamanites. Mormon, however, clarified what this meant. The Amalekites also had a mark set upon them, yea, they set the mark upon themselves, yea, even a mark of red upon their foreheads. This, Mormon wrote, was a fulfillment of the word of God, when he said, I will set a mark upon them. The Amalekites knew not that they were fulfilling the words of God when they marked their foreheads and brought the Lamanite curse upon themselves. What was the Lamanite mark then? It seems likely that it was a ritual scarring or tattoo that was applied to those who called themselves Lamanites or who allied themselves with them. This explanation, I believe, helps us better understand how this mark could appear so suddenly and then disappear within a single generation of people, as happened several times in the Book of Mormon. Regardless of the nature of the Lamanite mark, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints today denounces all forms of prejudice. Quote, Latter-day Saints scripture and teachings affirm that God loves all of his children and makes salvation available to all. God created the many diverse races and ethnicities and esteems them all equally. As the Book of Mormon puts it, all are alike unto God. Today, the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or curse, or that it reflects unrighteous actions in a premortal life, that mixed race marriages are a sin, or that blacks or people of any other race or ethnicity are inferior in any way to anyone else. Church leaders today unequivocally condemn all racism, past and present, in any form." Unquote. Returning to 2 Nephi chapter 5, because of the curse brought by their disobedience, the Lamanites became an idle people, full of mischief and subtlety, which means slyness or cunning, and did seek in the wilderness for beasts of prey. The Lord revealed to Nephi that the Lamanites shall be a scourge unto the Nephites to stir them up in remembrance of me. And so the Lamanites will remain the foil for the Nephites for the remainder of the narrative of the Book of Mormon. 540 years after Nephi, the Lamanites will become more righteous than the Nephites, but eventually they and the Nephites will fall into wickedness, and the Lamanites will destroy the Nephites entirely. That's it for this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button to give it a like and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download the notes and slideshow for this lesson. Next week, we'll study Jacob's teachings on the Messiah and the gathering of Israel. The reading is 2 Nephi chapter 6 through 10. See you next week.